for having me. No, I'm I'm thrilled to have you on. Um, what do you think there? Fit aid is it? Focus aid. Focus aid. That's yeah. like the brain power one. It's one from my from my mind. Oh yeah, it's no it's no rain. I'm sponsored by rain, so I'll. Oh, are you? Oh, nice. <laughs> I'll Photoshop in a can. You and uh, <laughs> every time your hand comes up. You and Jed, I mean, Jed's sponsored by them too. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Um, do you drink coffee as well? Oh yeah. Yes, I have an espresso machine and I drink espressos every morning. Are you saying espresso or Nespresso? <laughs> espresso. Oh, okay, I okay. don't have the little, the little cheater pod thing. No, 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 no. We're talking real grinds, making, yeah. the, making the appropriate. Uh, I, I typically do like a Cortado, a little bit of whole milk or something in there. That's my go-to. Nice. Cortados are big in Canada. Um, I had a few few guests on from Canada and they were all like I was asking them about flat whites because like that's yeah. what I drink and they were like oh Cortado and like and I, you know they're explaining the difference and everything so I think like, yeah it's like to be honest in cafes here aren't really open that much they're kind of only doing takeaways and stuff now but just before we went into lockdown yeah I was anywhere I went in I was asking for a Cortado because I think it's just the, it's like the more intense you can make it in my opinion right. anyway the better the more smack in the face you get the flavor right. the better and the less milk there is in it that's going to happen like so um, are you are you like snobby about it then are you like you know do you like research beans and get different beans or do you have like a specific one that you always go for or are you just like whatever's to hand i'll take it and i'll use it yeah i i mix it up i don't have like a set go-to bean i just I like just changing it up depending on what's available. Got a, a couple of local coffee shops that sell some good bean varieties, so I'll do that. And then also I do a lot of uh, do a lot of cold brew. I I actually you know cortado is like the only hot coffee I'll drink. Like if we're talking like traveling and out and about or whatever, uh, and you got to go to a Starbucks or something, I always get a cold brew. Always. It doesn't matter if it's negative 10 degrees outside i get a cold brew i don't know man i'm so weird like my friends know this about me and they think it's so bizarre but like i have a real sensitivity with hot beverages and so if i get a hot coffee it just sits forever until it's room temperature and then i'll drink it so i just go with the cold the cold drinks unless and when i make espressos a lot of times i'll put a couple ice cubes in there just drink them that way but yeah man i'm I'm a pansy when it comes to hot stuff that's interesting actually i'm the same so I uh, I don't like hot food or hot yes, like drinks. Exactly. Exactly. I kind of like tepid or like just over warm is fine. But anything over that, like if you have to blow on it, it's just a waste of everyone's time. Like it's not worth the effort. <laughs> like, um, right. you know, that's interesting. That's I like that. Um, a favorite coffee memory then. So I like to ask guests about maybe somewhere they were or someone they were with or you know something that. Um, I think flavors and smells and stuff have like a really strong like memory pathway built into them. So I'm always kind of curious, is there any kind of coffee you've had, not even the specific coffee, but like maybe who you were with or where you were or any kind of big news you got or anything around coffee? Hmm. I'm guessing with coaching and that, you must travel a lot. So surely there's. Well, I would say, you know, best coffee I've ever had was in Colombia, South America. I went there in Straight 2017. The I mean, yeah, you kidding me? Like it, it, it ought to be the best cup of yeah. coffee you have. Uh, I was so fortunate. I got to go there with my mom. We have some family friends who are from the area, from Bucaramanga and Bogota area. And we got to go there for a month uh, over Christmas in 2017. So we traveled around uh, the whole country and got to experience some incredible coffee. Mm. Uh, and, you know, in again, I'm no expert. I can't sit here and tell you the type of bean, where it was from, but um, I just know that I was fortunate to be amongst some of the best coffee in the world and uh, the way that it was always brewed, you know, always a pour over. And Mm. I think uh, that's um, so delightful. And yet something I never take the time to do. Mm. I think espresso is my most, you know, time towards coffee. uh, And that's the most labor that I'll put towards it. So like experiencing those pour overs in, in, South America was, gosh, I mean, I can, yeah, I can still picture sitting on the porch of the different villas we were staying in and the smell and being at, uh, at the beach on the coastline and, and all the different foods that come with it and breakfast. It was just amazing. amazing. Yeah. I think definitely my fondest coffee memories is in it's, Colombia. It's incredible. Like those kind of places where, you know, where coffee comes from 
that they're just like, oh, this is like terrible coffee that you just get in the shop and we taste it. We're like, oh, my God, it's life changing. Like I remember myself, and my wife went to um, Kenya on our honeymoon and they used to bring around coffee in the morning. And like as far as they were concerned, it was just some generic like, you know, mass produced bean. Whereas we, we were drinking and going like, oh, my God, this is insane. Like, it's so good. Like we were like, where do you get this coffee? And they're like just in the shop you know like it's no <laughs> i was like did you pick it this morning they're like no i just found it like in the shop it's just readily available you know like whereas it's for us it's like such a luxury to have coffee that that's that's that good yeah. um yeah. do you listen to a lot of podcasts i do i mean there's so many and, and it's it's constant overwhelming in the fitness space of podcasts but i do my best to stay up to date and listen to as much as i can uh, I also like a lot of like Tim Ferriss sort of stuff, a lot okay. of more of that um, kind of personal development, uh, mindset growth stuff. Uh, mm. I, I find very, very interesting and fascinating. It's stuff that I've spoken on and studied uh, since my accident. I've been a motivational speaker and speaking on these sort of uh, mindset um, kind of keynotes. And so mm. I, I love learning from uh, different leaders in that space and stoic philosophy and all those sorts of things what's your what are your go-to shows that you keep going back to tim ferris chasing excellence love ben bergeron love mm-hmm. his approach and stuff he pulls out um for inner for pure entertainment i think you know it's like the number one podcast in the world i listen to a lot of joe rogan mm-hmm. i listen to the, the joe rogan comedy stuff uh, all the time um and then um, Resilience Life is a great one. Uh, my good friends at Travis Man- Manning Foundation started that podcast. And Ryan Manning uh, is the host of it. She's an incredible host, has some awesome guests on there. Really cool to hear from like some, some C-suite level individuals as well as athletes and different perspectives on resilience and what it means and work. They're doing a workout now at the minute, aren't they? Isn't there something? I've seen something going around. Yeah. Like down the the today. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, the veterans workout, brutal one. Yeah. <laughs> I won't be doing it. <laughs> I uh, I listened to you on uh, Savan's podcast and on Talking Elite. That was yeah. Savan. I, like, like that dude is crazy. First of all, like he brings out the wild in everyone. That podcast started like uh, so, like how we just I signed on and we just started talking. That was it. That's how Savan yeah. ran it. And that dude had a list of so many questions. And gosh, I've never been so vulgar and explicit as I was on his podcast because I think that's what he brings out in people you know he starts yeah. dropping all the f-bombs and asking the inappropriate questions and you're like all right that's that's the theme that we're in here all right this is good yeah, it's funny because like if I have a guest on especially I'm always wary with Americans because I think there's a fine line with Americans where either they never ever swear and they like almost hate hearing it or yeah. they're like cowboy potty mouth don't care like the and blind all day long so it's it's always funny like uh say i was messaging samuel quant like a couple of weeks ago and the same day that i messaged him i had typed a message and there was a like i think there was one swear word in it and i hadn't sent it and i went back uh, doing something else and then he put up a post he restoried something from the crossfit games and it was like after a horrible workout at the games and he said something like you know gosh darn it or something at the end i was like i'll just go and delete that swear word <laughs> <into> that. <laughs> it's like he's not going to appreciate that yeah, um, yeah. D- i was curious though do you, like y- you've been involved in motivation speaking and keynote speaking and stuff like that since you were a teenager you've been on savannah's show you've been on talking elite you've been on other stuff do you ever get tired of telling your story no, not at all. That's a great question. You know, and because I do, I tell it a lot and I tell a very similar story on a lot of different podcast platforms. But, you know, as a professional speaker, laying up uh, my keynote, whatever topic may be, telling my story, explaining the background was important, not only for mm-hmm. the context of the message. Um, so I knew at a young age that like telling my story wasn't something that I should ever view as laborious or as like work for me. It's literally my story. It's my life, and I should share it. And I think more importantly, uh, it doesn't. It, I, I don't share it because I think my story is special, and I think I'm so important. Everyone should hear my story. Please know, any listeners, that like I do not view myself that way. I, I don't think I'm a big deal. I think I'm just another bro, another dude. I'm a 29 year old dude who's 
very into fitness, very passionate about it, and dedicated to trying to make a bigger impact and platform for more people after after my time on the surf. And I think um, I think telling my story is an incredible opportunity for others to relate. I think I know of countless examples of someone who's heard my story and said, you know, I've lived my life this way. I've been told by doctors and family that this is probably not possible for me. Thanks for sharing the story. Uh, I realize that you're just a dude and you're able to do these things through your mindset and, and your perspective on what we should and shouldn't be capable of or how we should perceive what's impossible and not possible. Um, so that's why I tell my story. You know, in my story, it always comes out and everyone knows this hashtag I use it all the time. It's just an arm, you know, the pivotal moment when my mother told me in the ambulance, you know, mom, what if I lose my arm? She looks at me and says, Logan, it's just an arm. That statement is what has defined my perception of my life after losing an arm, right? Like that statement allows me to, no matter when, even in today, when I'm frustrated or overwhelmed or struggling, I can remind myself, Logan, it's just an arm. And it might have, it has nothing to do with a physical limitation. I might be, it might be just, writing a paper or, or writing an article or doing something and I've, I've just got writer's block well the it's just an on statement for me is one that allows my brain to kind of refresh it allows me to appreciate have some gratitude in life and in the world and then hone in on how privileged i am to be able to do the things and be in the environment situation that i'm in now uh so that's yeah that's why i love telling my story and i never get i never get tired of it uh, for those exact reasons, because I think it it has an opportunity through my story to motivate someone to take some action with their life. So, in that case, <laughs> seeing as you never get sick of telling it, um, I'll give you the honor. So, I, I like I had a little recap prepared in my head, but because I was like, "Well, what if he do? What if he is just getting sick of telling the story?" But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I will. Thank you. Uh, and I'll try to do it in a way. You know, I can tell my story in a way that takes two hours. And I can tell my story in a way that takes closer to 10 minutes. I'll try to be on the ladder there, uh, especially if these listeners are familiar with me in any other way or heard any other uh, podcast. I don't want to bore them too long or yeah. lose them on this episode. But uh, long story short, I'm 29 years old, born and raised Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, uh, at 13 years old, uh, I was involved in a boating accident, wakeboarding. Now, for listeners who might not know that specifically, it's like water skiing behind the boat. Uh, but you're on a board, kind of like a snowboard. And the goal in wakeboarding as a sport is to jump the wake, like the waves that the boat creates, and do tricks and flips and spins and put together a run that's competitive. And my family were uh, some recreational competitive water skiers. They knew it professionally, but they skied, slalom skied uh, very well. So at a very young age, you know, six, seven, eight, I was introduced to that. And then by the time uh, I came about the age of 10 to 11, I saw wakeboarding for the first time. And that was like jaw drop. So I was in love with it. And I wasn't wakeboarding just to do it for fun. It was really uh, my path to professional, to being a professional athlete. I saw the professional athletes at the time and I was dedicated to becoming a professional wakeboarder. So that day at 13 years old was a day, a training day. Uh, it was a Saturday evening, just got done doing my run. Dropped my friend off at his dock, which is just about five docks down from mine. And on wakeboard boats, if you're familiar or if you're unfamiliar, there's a tower uh, that you connect mm -hmm. the rope to that's above the center of the boat. Um, the rope was connected to that tower, and the end of the rope was back behind the boat. And we pushed off after letting my training partner off at his dock, and my job was to tidy up the boat. So I began looping that rope over my thumb, under my elbow. Oh, like, like that, you, that kind of thing. Yeah, Exactly, like you might do with an extension cord or something, you know, to make those nice, neat uh, circles as you wind up a uh, cable cord or rope. So I had a couple loops like that. And with the end of the rope still being connected to that tower and myself standing towards the back of the boat with a couple of loops around my arm like that, I looked back and noticed that a portion of the rope had kind of just drifted underneath, like over the lip of the back platform on the boat which isn't like massively alarming because the propeller on a wakeboard boat is really close to the center of the boat. It's an inboard, you know, way up underneath the boat. Um, so, you know, there's a wedge and stuff back there. Sometimes the rope might get caught on it. So that's what I thought in my head. And my dad being at the cockpit at the wheel, just, you know, a few feet from me, I turned to him. I said, oh, dad, rope's underneath the boat again. So he took the precautionary measures to turn off the boat and put it into neutral. But literally, right when I said, oh, yeah, the rope's underneath the boat again, and turned to him, and he reached to turn off the boat, and we were just 
putting. Like we just had the boat in gear, just moving this fast, not flying or anything, not going real fast. Uh, but as soon as that happened, as soon as I said that, the propeller caught the rope. That rope had drifted further than I had realized underneath the back of that boat. And uh, it caught. And when it caught, as you can imagine, it just, it coiled it all up around that propeller and caused what I was holding to become very tight. So it pulled that part that I was holding really tight towards that back platform. And the result was it slipped off my thumb instantly, immediately just buckled and slipped off my thumb and cinched down uh, above my elbow on my left arm around my you know, bicep, tricep, kind of mid, mid, in, mid distance in the upper arm region. Uh, and it just cinched really, really tight. And I was just standing there on the boat, felt a little jerk. And I was still standing there on the boat, everything's fine. And my arm just went from holding that rope like this in the thumb to then just like kind of being straight out. My, I was still holding my arm up, but it was just straight out like this. And the rope looked like it was going, literally looked like it just fed into the inside of my arm and just came out the other side. Because that, that rope, uh, to give you some context on the rope, was coated in plastic. Wakeboard ropes, you don't want any elasticity. So this rope looked and acted as much like a cable as it possibly could. So uh, for better or for worse, in this instance, it just allowed that rope to slice through flesh and muscle and tendons and arteries very easily. Uh, so it was basically just cinched down around my bone, two loops of that rope, just tight tourniquet around my bone and it cut through everything else. So in that one and a half second where that happens, my dad, you know, immediately steps over from where he is, begins to unwind that rope from my arm as I'm just standing here and looking at it, baffled, I'm like, what, what, what just happened? Not even in pain, just kind of like, what just happened? And as he unwinds that rope, that's when, I mean, it was pure bloodshed. Like, pure, like we're on a 21 foot white wakeboard boat. And when he unwound that, and I was standing on the back, like towards the back one third of the boat. When he unwound that, the entire boat like was covered in blood in 30 seconds. I mean, truly like, and I'm not even doing my best to tell this exactly as it was because it was unbelievable. Like it was like, it was like, you know, in films in like the movie 300, when you see the freaking blood just fly across the screen, like Quentin Tarantino style movie. Like that was legit. I was like, this is insane. This is fake. This is Hollywood. Because it was, you know, um, just for the sake of why, you know, left arm, your heart pumps right into your left arm, and that artery was immediately severed. So that's why the blood was so, so drastic and so bad. And so how far are we out. from like a hospital? Like what? Like surely there's a finite amount of time that someone can yeah. have an, an open artery spraying yeah. around the place. So you know, thank God for the next action my dad took. So as soon as he unwound that, he ripped his shirt off you know, wrapped it into like a rope, wrapped it around my arm, pulled it as tight as he could, stuck a rod through it, twisted it, pulled it tight again. So he created an instant tourniquet. Mm. Had he not done that, yeah, 100% would have bled out and died in five minutes. So we were at Lake Gaston, which your listeners probably don't know where this is in the United States, but it's on the border of North Carolina and Virginia in the middle of nowhere. Mm. In hindsight, like all it takes to get to that lake from Raleigh, where I live, where there are endless level one trauma hospitals, UNC and Duke and these great hospitals, only takes about an hour and a half to get here. But in the state of the chaos and the state of everything happening, getting off the boat to our dock, being at this lake where we're kind of in the middle of like farmland country, uh, not knowing what to do, we called the local community hospital, which was technically in Virginia, uh, took an ambulance an hour to get to me through volunteer staff Saturday in the summer. By the time they got to me, that's when it was just my mom and I in the ambulance. We went to this local community hospital. And that was on the ride there when I started to think about what might happen, what just did happen, and what's the future about to be like. Am I just going to have a badass scar around my upper arm and that'll be a cool story or, or what? Because in the ambulance, I feel as if my arm is laying across my body and yet my arm is laid out on the side. So my brain immediately said, oh, whoa, 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 something is not right. Every bar part of my brain tells me my arms across my body and it's laying way over there. So that's when I started to think, mom, what if like, I don't have any feeling, like this isn't gonna work anymore. What if I lose my arm? And that's when she said those most impactful words to me, Logan, it's just an arm. 
so from there, you know, I started to think about that, like recognize the reality of the situation. And determine just what- even, even to hone in on that, like I told my wife this story this morning. Yeah. So uh, she was asking who I was interviewing and I said, oh, explain who you were. And then I was like, I'll tell you a cool thing about it was I was like, his mom was in the ambulance with him on the way. And I didn't realize that your arm was like totally separate at this point. So like, obviously she's, she's looking down and thinking, son, you've already lost your arm. But like I said to Orla, I was like, oh, and his, his, I said, you know what his mom said? And she was like, like, I don't know, don't panic or, you know, try to reassure him. I was like, no, she just said, it's just an arm. And like, I actually, like I got goosebumps saying it to her because I was like, the last thing that 99.9% of the population would say to their child is it's just an arm but it's probably like you know future proofing wise it's probably the most useful thing you could say in that scenario because like it, she could have lied to you she could have said like yeah you're probably fine don't worry sh-, and like you know covered your eyes or whatever but like in two hours time you're going to hear the truth anyway but i think it's the fact that it's had such a profound effect on like the rest of your life is proof positive of like what she said you know i mean if you, if you wrote that story down and read it to someone and just stopped there some people would be like geez what a bitch like you know that's you know what a yes, cold, cold right. hearted thing to say but right. like you know you're 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 the way that you're living your life i suppose is proof that like what she said resonated and like even the way you tell the story like it seems to have just instantly calmed you down and just been like right well you know yeah she has a point like which I suppose kudos to you for having that mentality to be like, yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, she's right. Because I think most people would be like, what? It's not just, you know, (laughs) there might be more of an aggressive reaction to that. But yeah, I think it's it's one of those, uh, I think, very rare human interactions where the exact right thing is said and it's heard by the exact right person who needed to hear that exact thing. And I think those kind of moments are so rare, but like, yeah, it's, I think that's just an incredible part of the story. 100%. And, yeah, and I always like to take a moment, especially when, when I respect and appreciate how impactful that statement was, uh, to give the listeners or the audience some context on my mom. Because, yeah, she's not. She's, it was from no place like, ah, suck it up, Logan. Yeah, she wasn't like do, 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 doing a crossword. And be like, ah, it's just an error. Yeah, you an know what? A 12 letter word for <laughs> Logan. It's nearly a flesh wound. What are you <laughs> complaining about? No, not at all, man. I think, you know, uh, well, first of all, my mom's a tough woman, like always has been. Her mother is, and her mother is. I was grateful to, to know my great grandmother growing up and know the stories about her and and of my grandmother currently uh, still alive and my mother's the same way uh tough love like like that's the way it's it it is uh and wouldn't want it any other way you know like oftentimes like my mom never really coddled me as a kid like honestly you know for for saving arms it was like you'd run to, to to dad dad would be the one who would save you mom would be the one who would be like oh no you messed up in the grocery store today it's time for your spanking or whatever it might be so my mother was always the tough cookie, but pure love, right? And so for um, this instance, I think, yes, it was the right thing for me to hear. But I also think, fortunately enough, it was very much so the right thing for herself to tell herself. Uh, I think as a mother, uh, as parents watching this unfold with their kid, not at all their fault, but every bit under their guidance, you know, mm-hmm. on the boat with them. Uh, this is years later for me looking at this from different perspectives, trying to understand how they might have felt in that time. But like, I can't imagine, right? I can't imagine being them, being parents mm-hmm. on the boat. You watch this happen to your kid and he's about to die maybe from loss of blood and you're trying to get him to, you know, it's just crazy. So I understand when I think about putting myself in her shoes, how, okay, let's just get through this ambulance ride. Logan, it's just an arm. You're with mm-hmm. me. You're alive. You're talking. It's just an arm. And I think yeah. that context is the the narrative she was playing in her head. And then for me to hear those words out of her mouth, instead of like, I don't know, Logan, I don't, who knows what's going to happen. Let's just, let's just hope for the best. No, instead of saying, you know what, Logan, it's just an arm. You might keep it uh, and you might have a really cool story or it might go away. And if so, you've got another one and we'll figure out how to make that one awesome for you. Uh, so I think that's like what, what I was hearing in my head when I heard her say that. Um, but also I was just like, okay, yes, hang on to life. 
hang on yeah. to life. Stay awake. Talk to these doctors. Talk to these people around you. Don't go unconscious. And I think that was the most expected thing was to lose consciousness because the amount of blood I was losing. So it was just very important to me to just continue to breathe, continue to breathe in, breathe out and move your eyes, like move your eyes. And um, that statement uh, was in vigor. That statement was like, all right, all right, I got this. No matter what happens, it's all very uncertain. I got this. Uh, so that's what happened. So we went to the local hospital there. They pulled me out of the ambulance and they were like, whoa, this is level one trauma. Like we are not equipped to deal with this. So they put me back in the ambulance. This is the coolest part. This is the coolest part. This part should be like in a movie, at least I think. And I'm obviously biased here. But uh, they put me back in the ambulance and they're like, they called Duke Children's Hospital, UNC Children's Hospital. UNC said, we've got a helicopter in the air right now. We know where your location is. Bring them to these coordinates. Because, you know, this little hospital didn't have a helicopter pad by any means. So they put me back in the ambulance and they bring me out to a field, like a cornfield. And I'm feeling like the ambulance like bouncing around and then they stop and then you open the doors at this point. It's like the sun is just going down. Um, they open the doors, they pull me out. And then I start to hear like that helicopter. And I just see this like nose down, badass looking chopper, huge helicopter come turn around, face me and then just come down and land. And I remember that happening, my eyes being huge and looking at the, the EMS crew with me being like, that's for me. And they're like, that's for you, Logan. And I was like, this is badass. And they were laughing and they wheeled me out there. And I still, the pilot to this day, his name's Brian, still know him to this day. Uh, one of the coolest guys. And you know, this, this is a huge part of my recovery, like my perception, how I am, the way I am with this guy with one arm. Man, every person, I'm so fortunate. I'm so privileged to have the care that I had. Not only my family, my peers, my support group, but the helicopter pilot, the, the medical staff on the helicopter, the physicians in the ICU, they all checked in with me daily, not because it was part of their job, but just because they were curious. And right. because maybe because I had a bit of a personality and I was saying some jokes, some things maybe a little bit inappropriate more than others. And I think that they might've uh, been like, okay, I'd like to see how this guy's doing as, uh, as this recovery goes along for him. So yeah, they, they flew me to UNC Children's Hospital. You know, next thing you know, you're surrounded by all these doctors ripping off your clothes, asking all these questions, going into surgery. Uh, they tried to save my arm for like a week. They took an artery out of my leg, got blood flow back, did all this crazy stuff. Uh, ultimately, the muscles would not accept the blood flow. We had just missed that window of yeah. about seven to eight hours without circulation where they'll start to die. Uh, and they were dying. And so they tried to save for a few days, realized high risk of gangrene if we continue down this route. Um, so they went to my parents and said, hey, we can continue rehabilitation. We can try all sorts of rehabilitation stuff. Gangrene increases and the, th the likelihood of him gaining full function of this arm ever is very low. So my parents made the decision and said, you know what? He's 13. Yes, this is his dominant arm. He is left-handed, but let's not, he's the most active kid. He can't stay still. Like, why don't we give clarity instead of false hope and mm -hmm. expectations moving forward and just conclude with this unfortunate accident, remove the arm and let Logan move on. Cause mm -hmm. nothing above that arm, nothing above that, that, you know, that, that where the accident happened was impacted. So my body's fine. So they're like, let's just let him uh, adapt and figure out how to live a life with this way. And you know, that a lot of hope, and talk and prosthetics and hey we can get an artificial arm and all this stuff will happen down the road too and that was all uh, all great and um basically what i'm getting at is if i had the decision if i would have had the decision i would have made the exact same one my parents made mm. made and i'm so thankful they did uh wouldn't change it for the world your formative years then obviously were spent pursuing adrenaline and you know i guess wakeboarding you probably include that as an extreme sport like there's a definite element of danger there with you know being meters up in the air, holding onto a rope and stuff. Um, after your injury, like how did those early years of finding and developing, like obviously adaptability in everyday life, but also I assume you had that innate drive to want to be active and stuff. Like how, how did, uh, how did you get around pursuing fitness goals and stuff like that? Oh yeah. I mean, a uh, great question. And you know, I have endless examples of, uh, how I was, definitely not following the proper recovery of an arm amputation. I, uh, 
you know, they amputated the arm and they let me out. But like, I was begging every day, let me out, was, like, let me out of here. I was in the hospital for almost three weeks. And for an arm amputation, that's a really long time. Like, it, I just didn't feel like it, I needed to be there that long. And the care was phenomenal, loved it. But like, you know, I am insanely active and, and was by no means thinking, oh, I have this arm, I'm gonna go home and like relax and become, no, I was like, let me go. Like, I wanna go back outside. I wanna go hang out with my friends. I wanna go back on the boat. Um, so once I finally got out of the hospital, uh, man, I was right back into like summer football training camp with my friends. I was running every day with my mom, trying to get back into fitness. And uh, a couple months after I was skateboarding with my friend and I actually slipped on the skateboard and this way, like back towards my amputated arm, my brain's first thought was stick out your arm to save yourself. And I landed on this tiny little nub and snapped this humerus in half, which was, whoa, my God, you don't talk about pain. Like that, that was the most painful thing I've ever had done in my life. Not the arm getting chopped off or the rope and all that. None of that hurt. Oh my God, falling and breaking this little bone. Uh, and that happened the day before I was supposed to get fitted for my first prosthetic. So uh, my mother was pissed, to say the least, and um, took a while for it to heal. After that healed, uh, I was again being way too active. I still had sutures on the end of the amputation on the distal end of my residual limb. And I was like out running and doing you know, conditioning drills and my bone broke through the muscles. So the bicep and tricep that was connected at the end retracted. And so you could basically just see like bones sticking out of the end, kind of like how your knuckle would look. Uh, so I actually had to go back into the hospital and they had to remove another inch and a half of my humerus because I was too active too soon. So, uh, so yeah, I was, I was pushing the limits as soon as they let me out. Um, the only thing that kept me out of getting into the water, like going back to wakeboarding the first day, um, was just the fear of infection. Like I would have gone back to wakeboarding that same day, but I gave it a year. I gave it the whole winter. Um, to heal, to make sure that the scar, everything was good before I went back to wakeboarding. And so then at 14, uh, as soon as I could, like the water was still freezing here in, in North Carolina uh, in March, I went back to wakeboarding. Uh, and throughout that whole winter, and even while I was in the hospital still, uh, I knew I'm going to live one arm the rest of my life, this right arm. Uh, I grip train every day. Like to me, the most important thing for me to do, the two most important sports in my life at that time wakeboarding and lacrosse. If I'm going to participate in these extremely arm dominant uh, sports, this one right arm is going to need to have the most dexterity, coordination, stamina, endurance, strength, all of the proponents of fitness need to be at, at their peak for this right arm to just try to be competitive with my peers. Uh, and that was my mindset. Like I knew this, 13 years old, chopped my arm off, laying in the hospital, all drugged up. And I told my brother, I said, hey, so give me one of those grip things. I said, also give me some of those Chinese meditation balls that you like spin around in your hand. I feel like that's going to help. And he did. And they brought those stuff in and I would just all day while I'm having people visiting, you know, messing with that or a hundred, hundred grips and then rest until I can do another hundred. Um, so that was my approach. And because I knew I was like everything, everything I'm fearful of having to try to a challenge that's going to be faced moving forward, like these highly active goals I have for myself to play lacrosse, to wakeboard again, to play golf, to participate in activity and work out with my friends. Like I knew that these things would take a ton of discipline on my side. When no one's watching, when no one's looking, when you're laying in bed, when you're not around your friends and it's easy to wander in your thought and to think about what if, why me, what if, no, no, no. None of that was allowed to creep in because it was just, okay, what can I do? What can I do about it? And every moment was, I know, all right, I can work on this arm. I can work on something. Uh, so that was extremely uh, therapeutic for me to have something in my control. Like I can work on this arm. I can work on my fitness and how I recover from this. Even with breaking the bone through and freaking snapping this thing, you know, I, my focus was this thing. I said, okay, this is all new to me, right? Like I was left-handed, everything, trying to figure it out writing again, doctors were telling me in the hospital that I would never learn to write again. This is mind blowing to me. Uh, and it was my first experience with expectations and how I understand people with disabilities, and I give that air quotes because 
I think in the medical field, it's it's we we get compartmentalized. We get put into this this category. Um, you are this way. You are an upper extremity above LABT. Here are the things you will be able to do. Here are the things you'll struggle with a lot. And I think that's a scary road to go down from medical professionals and from your you know, your, your occupational therapists and the information and opportunity they may explain to you exists. Uh, and so, yeah, I think it was an interesting um, first uh, experience with expectations, that one of handwriting. And one, you know, where I, I like to give this example in terms of the really like archaic way to put it, like if I would just accept it, their expectation, like I just wouldn't write. I would just be living this life. I'd be this 49 year old dude being like, yeah, I lost mom at 13. Uh, doc said you won't write again. So I'm not, I don't write. I just type and, and text like, what in the world? Why? Why accept that? So I just didn't. I was just like, okay, what I'm going to do the alphabet while I'm laying here in the hospital bed. And I did start writing the alphabet. I'm like, like with anything, with anything, you can do it with enough practice and repetition. And that's all it was. I just had to practice a little bit. I mean, literally like a month, a month. And I was writing with my right hand just as legibly as a 13 year old was, would write with their dominant hand, right? So there's no difference. Uh, and I think that is where I became obsessed with this message, this keynote that I initially spoke upon uh, about beyond expectations. Beyond expectations came to the, the brand of, of my speaking platform. And um, what that meant was not like, don't, not about being a perfectionist, not about exceeding what people think of you, but about uh, only holding yourself accountable to the expectations placed on yourself. Uh, on yourself, because uh, I believe that expectations in my experience, the definition of it are prejudgments we place on ourselves and one another that typically limit potential. I think most of the time uh, expectations, when we meet them, when we know what external ones are placed on us, we go ahead and give ourselves uh, that gratitude, that accomplishment, pat on the back when we met the expectations of other people. Now, what does that what does that do for you? That is, that is not helpful. I don't believe. I believe that we're far more capable than we believe, and that we can exceed our own expectations. When we do so, there's a really unique ripple effect that happens that empowers other people to realize the potential of humans. And that means physically, spiritually, emotionally. Uh, that's what I mean by beyond expectations. It's kind of doing the unexpected because that has the biggest impact and ripple effect on other individuals. Yeah, I'll be honest, like I like I love that to controlling the controllables and that kind of uh attitude of you know something so harrowing going on and just defying, you know, not angrily, but just being like, yeah, okay, whatever you think, and then be like, well, I'm just gonna do what I think is right or whatever. For a lot of that, I was just picturing the bone breaking through uh the base of <laughs> your arm for a good two minutes there. I was just picturing <laughs> what that would have looked like. So I needed to in my own head, I needed to just get that out and move past it because I would have just hung on to that for the whole rest of the episode, thing, like just trying to picture it. But I'm I'm, I'm past sure. it now. I'm fine. I'm um, glad you asked that question. I don't think I've ever told that story specifically. So I'm <laughs> glad I painted that picture for the listeners. <laughs> I'm assuming uh I'm assuming most people you know or like train with are just like, you know, all oh, that's Logan doing workouts, fine. Like others, um, like myself included, it's hard not to marvel at like, I suppose just all of it, like the movement, the strength, the, you know, the persistence that must have gone into it. Like, obviously, I suppose the same can be said for an able-bodied athlete who you see like banging out ridiculous amount of pull-ups or ring muscles or snatches or whatever there's hard work persistence dedication has all gone into that like th that thing of do do in the dark so you can shine in the light like you know do what when other people aren't watching and stuff but like i suppose it's an extra element when the person you're watching has one arm or one leg or no use of their legs or you know it's just astonishing without like and i'm always conscious of i don't want to come across as like patronizing or you know like i'm patting anyone on the head like far from it i'm just in awe of i suppose like the physical capabilities but i suppose my my uh real love of it is for the adaptability like that stuff that you're talking about the the mental side of it of saying like you know resisting against expectations that are put on you by you know science or other people's experience and like do you know I'm, I'm honored to talk to you and share your story and to give you a new, hopefully a new audience and a new platform. Like, to be honest, it's not even a question. I got kind of waylaid there halfway through. I can't remember what I was starting out with, 
but <laughs> I just I think I just needed to say that I've watched a lot of your stuff and I'm like my mind is boggled by it um I'll try and bring it back to something now so when you started <laughs> when you started training CrossFit like doing classes and that kind of stuff was it a case of your coaches um because I, I guess it's rare to have someone uh like an adaptive athlete come into a gym in most cases anyway so was it a case of them saying like okay this dude's got one arm how can i make him do wall balls what can i find how can i make him do that or was it like more on you were you looking at things that they were doing and thinking right what version of that can i can do or was it like a combined effort yeah great question it was uh it was on me it was on me uh and i wanted it to be that way yeah you know, I, I went around to a lot of CrossFit affiliates in my area, um, dropped in, was just flying on the wall, just wanted to participate. But I wasn't, I was not going around expecting to walk into a facility and someone say, hey, I know how to train. Not at all. I was just, hey, let me come into your environment and figure out what this is like. Uh, there'll be instances where I'm challenged and I don't know what to do. And then maybe I'll come to you and we'll talk through it. Uh, or I might just be creating solutions on the fly here. Uh, and, and that's what happened. Like the the gym I ended up joining, the owner and the manager, they're like, listen, I can't, I cannot begin to sit here and tell you, I'm going to know what to tell you to do or how to coach you on technique or, or whatnot. But if you're willing to come in here and learn, uh, you're welcome. And so that's all it was. Uh, and that's the way I am. Like, that's the way I am about anything. I love to dive in and learn, um, maybe rather than be coached or told how to do something. And um, this was the best scenario for me to walk into. Because every day was a new challenge, a new situation that I was trying to create a solution for. And always in my mind, I think from the very beginning, was this thoughtful uh, approach to, okay, this person looks similarly fit to me, able-bodied, they got their arms and legs. They did this workout, Nancy. It took them this time. Their rounds were like this. They looked like by that, you know, towards the end, they were like dying and barely finished okay all right let me try that workout what happens if okay the runs the run saying do i reduce the weight do i change the movement is is the version of an overhead squat for a one-arm individual way more taxing way higher stimulus than a two-arm overhead squat is it the load or is it the actual position of the body uh, these are the things that i'm thinking about one-arm burpees like do i if i do 10 burpees next to a two-arm person are the same speed and are they creating a similar stimulus? Uh, and these are like the, I was, I, I didn't have like hard data around any of this, but this is the questions I was asking myself every day as I observed a class and then prepared myself to adapt the movements and participate. Um, and I think that was the first step to trying to be this adaptive solution oriented approach to functional fitness. And then I just came to accept. I became obsessed and said, okay, what happens if you're an above knee amputee? Okay. What happens if you're in a wheelchair and you're a T12 paraplegic? So like, we're like, you know, below your pec line, like mm. you've got nothing. Like what happens there? Uh, and this was right at the time when I started CrossFit in 2014, right at the time of Kevin Ogar's injury. So there was a lot of light bulb moments happening to me as I stepped into this functional fitness space of CrossFit. Uh, and yeah, I told my affiliate owner at the time, I said, Hey, my mission is to be the face of continuing education, opportunity, and empowerment for people with disabilities to get into fitness. Right now, it looks like CrossFit is an awesome platform to do that with. And that's where I was going after. And this was like, you know, day one, day one of walking into a CrossFit gym. That's what I said. Uh, and it's been really cool to like, you know, reflect, look back and see, gosh, 2014 to 2020 to now, like it's not that long, like it's only been six years. And to think about the pro progress we've made uh, as, as a whole, as a community, as wheelwad and competitions, and then now as, gosh, CrossFit headquarters, bringing it in, like making it official. Uh, it's just, it's just, we, I never stop. I can never stop every day for the past six years has been with this goal and focus in mind. Um, with that in mind, the Wheel Wild Open starts uh, 30th of November. Is that right? Yeah, gosh. Yeah, like, 30th this, of November. This Monday. weekend. Yeah, Monday. 
Um, so it's five workouts, and I guess similar to the the CrossFit Open, similar style, I guess. Um, right. When you're planning those workouts, then, and when those workouts are being set up, and when it's being devised, and the because I was looking earlier on at the uh what would you call it like the prerequisites to be an rx seated athlete or a scale seated athlete and that kind of stuff um like is it a case of basically what you were saying there with nancy where you're pitting you're kind of i guess imagining it like i picture it like you know tekken when you're picking a character to play as and it's like the strengths and weaknesses that you're looking at these different i guess like a cookie cutter version of different athletes saying like, okay, well, we'll assume that everyone with a T12 injury can do this if they've signed up. And we'll assume everyone with, you know, an, an amputee can do this if they've signed up. And we'll assume whatever, right. that they've read the terms and conditions, that they understand that this is what's expected of them. And then after that, you just pick each character or each, you know, adaptive athlete bracket and say, we need to give them all this stimulus. And we need to give them all this level of exhaustion of their you know whatever movement and we need to put them under fatigue for this and then we need to test this and then you just find a different way is is it basically just like you described there with when you were trying to figure out how to do nancy yes when yes when and this is where it might get confusing for listeners because of the new opportunity for adaptive athletes to compete because now crossfit has we're going to be in the open and we're going to be in the games. Mm. Wheel Wad, you know, okay, so let's let's pretend CrossFit hasn't made that announcement yeah. and Wheel Wad exists separately. Uh, CrossFit appreciates, loves everything we do. They're supportive of it. They're just, we're just not officially a part of it, right? We're a separate own thing. Yeah. What we would do every year around February when the open comes out is we would adapt from the able bodied perspective. So the open gets released and literally this is what we do. like. You know, CrossFit, even though we're on good graces and, you know, our friends with them and they support us, they wouldn't share those workouts early. So they'd get released Thursday night, you know, and we would stay up all night uh, taking that workout in and adapting it amongst our eight divisions that we have, eight different adaptive divisions. So, yes, from what you're saying, that's how we have to approach that when the original prescribed workout is in an able-bodied context. Yeah. What's really awesome about this coming up, our wheel wide open happening, you know, November 30th, starting November 30th, three weeks, five workouts, two workouts a week, last one, one, I think. Uh, the way that this works is very unique, right? Because we don't have to go from, here's what the open is, able-bodied okay. stimulus. Now it's, now we have eight divisions where we can test their fitness completely. Oh, so we you can, can do can, eight totally different workouts like? Totally different workouts, right? The okay. upper extremity workout doesn't need to look or be similar at all okay. to the seated workout. Now you're right. We want to follow certain intention, right? Yeah. Like there's certain, you know, one is intentionally a uh, heavy lift or it's intentionally, or trying to discover, you know, your time on this monostructural yeah. sprint or whatever it is, right? So like, we'll stay within themes, but now we can 100% focus on testing fitness. Yeah. not adapting and seeing who is the most able to adapt in the skill or the setting right so there's some really really cool benefits from from this situation are you ever tempted to put up clues you know the way castro puts up his stupid pictures of statues and shit like that are you ever tempted to put up like some totally unrelated picture and try and get people guessing oh my gosh 100 percent. so if i so let me get some clarity there as well i uh you know, I'm a co-founder, co-owner of Adaptive Training Academy and of Wheel Walk. Um, but I'm also an athlete. So Wheel Walk is Wheel Walk is a part of ATA, Adaptive Training Academy. It's like a it's a component of us. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. Like ATA is the overarching umbrella company of all things adaptive training. And we are the Adaptive Training Academy. And our programming, competition programming, performance programming, and competition consulting. All happens under Wheelwad. Now, Wheelwad, yeah, because I'm an athlete and I compete, there's this there's this line of separation where I'm not allowed to know what's happening in my company. So, yeah. Wheelwad is ran by Chris Stoutenberg. Chris is uh, in Collingwood, Ontario. You know, 
20 year seated athlete, three time Paralympic wheelchair basketball player, phenomenal athlete, coach, programmer, able bodied programmer. He brought an athlete to the CrossFit Games last year. Uh, he programmed for an able bodied athlete on wheel wide program and qualified for the CrossFit Games. Pretty awesome. That's good. Um, so he's a phenomenal able bodied programmer. Uh, and then absolutely, he heads that division. He's the director of programming on behalf of F Training Academy and Wheelwad. But yes, yeah, so to answer your question, uh, if I were to retire, if I were to not compete anymore, which I have no plan on doing, like if anything, I am more invigorated and more fired up to compete and excel as an athlete now more than ever from the legitimacy of process inclusion. And I still think make that happen. I was going to ask, so like Eric, Rosa was on talking elite and I think I don't know if he intended to do it but he like basically leaked information yes. where he yeah. he said something I think it's it, like it seems to have rippled through the community like morning chalk up or putting up stuff there's all like CrossFit even just since that announcement or I don't again I don't think it was supposed to be an announcement but since he said what he said I've noticed a big ramp up in CrossFit like Instagram page putting up more like you know inclusive posts and stuff and they're obviously making a big effort and like he mentioned that efforts are being made to have an inclusive open and a game season where adaptive athletes have a space to compete and he also and I think like really importantly I think he said that he knows it won't be perfect in 2021 but that they're working towards it because I think a big mistake that not just CrossFit but other companies have made in the past have been like we've turned over a new leaf and then it's a bit of a flop and then everyone's pissed off and like you know the adaptive community would be pissed off the spectators would be pissed off able-bodied people would be pissed off being like god oh, i was a waste of everyone's time or whatever but i think saying it at the start we might fuck it up we'll do our best we're going to talk to people that they have like these inclusive panels that they've set up they've got all this kind of stuff going on that they're, they're obviously really trying to do it the right way like i guess a two-part question for you on it is like what can people expect from the inclusive open and what boxes do you think in your opinion CrossFit need to tick in order to stand back at the end and say yeah we fucking nailed that great great questions um so it's really it's so, so yes Eric said that it was amazing so great to hear him come out and publicly say that um uh, we've been working with them. So uh, ATA, Adapt Training Academy, we've been the consultants with CrossFit over the past few months discussing this, seeing that it really is feasible. Um, and then also, you know, giving no light on when the public announcement would be made. So there's still a lot to work on. There's still a lot to solidify, but uh, it was so cool to hear him state it in the way that he did. And with the understanding that like, this will take improvement, this will take mm -hmm. time to improve. But also know that like we've been doing this for a long time we've been doing this since 2012 we're really well prepared i think more so than um maybe crossfit staff expects uh, which is great we plan on over delivering in all, all the ways that we execute this um but i think there's a lot of consideration that goes into it because when a brand like crossfit endorses and says they're going to support and make this platform a reality for this population uh big eyes turn like crossfit's a big you know the paralympic committee turns and looks uh and that's phenomenal that's fantastic because uh it's it's what we've been trying to create all along right now we have the backing behind the official brand of what we've been doing the sport of what we've been doing and, and that's crossfit and so i think the boxes that need to be checked in order for this to be ran uh effectively safely and and really create a platform to deem the fittest on earth in their respective adaptive category is first of all are defining the, the classification well first of all defining the division hmm. we intend and now this is again this is hard to say with confirmation but i believe that we'll have eight divisions within crossfit um, and within those eight divisions we'll have to create a classification procedure so I think the, the most important box to check is clarity on classification, what that means. You know, there is really tough to be inclusive of everyone, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, it's really difficult. Like there are um, parameters, you know, there, there are levels to which you're going to qualify and not qualify depending mm -hmm. on your impairment or the severity of that impairment. 
Um, and this is hard for me to say because, you know, I'm, everyone's welcome, arms wide open. We want everyone to participate and, and join. But also at the same token, like we're talking about CrossFit as a sport. We're talking about competitive athletes competing for a title. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a really clear um, context around that. Because what this is not going to be is showing up to the CrossFit games, coming out on the floor, doing the workout, and everyone just going, oh, it is so cool that they do that. No, they're yeah. out there battling for first, second, and third place. And mm -hmm. the prize money goes along with it. Uh, and it will not be represented by the person with the least uh, in, in disabled impairment or whatever the case may be, right? Um, that's on us. That's on how we structure the programming and how we create this platform. But I think the most important part for CrossFit and for us to help CrossFit execute and deliver really well is the classification procedure um, and expectations there. So that every adaptive athlete who's interested, curious, hasn't done CrossFit, but wants to participate and see what this is like, that they have clarity around it and not a ton of questions. Well, this is how the Paralympics does it. Why are you doing it this way and whatnot? So um, that is what we're right now, ATA and Wheelwad, this is what we're spending most of our time doing right now is making sure that we've buttoned up the uh, legitimacy of the classification procedures so that when we get these athletes, you know, to the CrossFit games, um, it's, it's the exact representation we're looking for. Yeah, I like that. The, the the no quibbles at the end is, I think it's always important to try and minimize. You'll always have someone giving out about something, but to try and minimize their opportunity to do it, I think is important with everything. Um, speaking of competing, you've done a lot of, uh, you've got a lot of competitive experience behind you. Um, I think, I, like, I'm curious what has been your favorite competition to date and why? Uh, well, I mean, I would selfishly, I would probably say the 2019 wheel wide games, um, cause I won and because I, I was, I, I mean, regardless of winning, uh, I think I was the fittest I've ever been. Like, I, I think I was all the programming leading up to that, like the training I was doing was brutal. And I thought I was destroying myself and to go there, uh, and perform the way that I did. Uh, I PR'd my clean and jerk. That's the one that went viral, what seems like a lifetime ago, but of me wearing the blue shirt, doing a barbell clean and jerk, trying to do two reps, second reps, real sketchy, uh, and I don't make it. But uh, that happened there at that competition, and that was 200 pounds. That was a one rep PR, which ended up being the one rep that I got, but uh, a goal that I've had for a year leading up to that. So to hit 200 and almost hit it for two, uh, was a huge like achievement for me in my in my strength training, um, and then also there was like a really brutal row run row workout, or no run row run workout, really long endurance, and that's normally where I get destroyed. Uh, and I won that event, and so uh, to win that event and to the only event I came in second on was the swimming event. Uh, and normally that's where I, I drown. Normally that's where I like, I'm last place swimming in circles where everyone's doing laps. Um, freaking horrible at swimming. Pisses me off. Uh, and I got a lot better at it. <laughs> yeah, right? And I got really good. I got really good at it, or at least in my, in my world of swimming, I got really good at it in 2019. So uh, I just, I really did. I believe that the weaknesses I had, the holes I had as a, a competitive adaptive CrossFit athlete in 2018, really got buttoned up and um i think i performed exactly how i wish i would in 2019 we'll so that in terms of me my performance as an athlete looking at it critically um best best i've ever done now in terms of like fun event and I, it wasn't even a competition but one of the funnest like fitness feats i've gotten to do was the 200 rep deadlift with uh, ct fletcher that was incredible I got to do 200 reps at body weight a challenge with ct fletcher uh, and that was just wild just because he's just like, you know, the master motivator, the ultimate YouTube guy of get huge. So it was fun to be with him. I've heard a lot of good things about like, um, live loud series or and like, you know, what and the environment that they've cultivated and in the adaptive arena. And I know when Jenny oh, yeah. was on, he was singing their praises. Like, how important is it that companies like those and series like those and events like those have done some of the groundwork so that CrossFit, so that it's not just, I guess, a total separate entity 
that's doing something because I guess if Wheelwad was doing it every year it's kind of like all right okay that's yeah that's cool you know it's, it seems to be working for them but then I guess it must bring legitimacy to it when Wadapalooza put it on and you know I think wasn't there supposed to something was supposed to happen at Granite Games this year was it or somewhere else it was supposed yeah. to be something going on I think yeah so yeah that must help a lot Oh man, one absolutely. We wouldn't be where we are. We wouldn't. We wouldn't be having this announcement. We wouldn't be where we are today without Wadapalooza. Specifically, mm-hmm. Guido in the beginning. You know, Guido founded that and and gave Steph Hammerman. You know, she reached out and was like, "What about that division?" He was like, "From the very beginning." He's like, "Yeah, absolutely, there should be." Mm-hmm. So you know, in terms of uh, example of representation, example of how to do it right, uh, Wadapalooza has been doing it right since day one. Mm-hmm. Um, from that massive, you know, international competition platform and then allowing the adaptive divisions to participate. Um, now there's a couple tweaks in there we wish could be different. Like Wadapalooza really can only allow three different categories, mm-hmm. standing, um, upper, lower, and seated. So it's, it's, it's limited in sense to really identify the fittest person mm-hmm. and give them that title. But inclusion is there 100%. Inclusion mm-hmm. and the opportunity to compete on the same platform is there 100 and it's amazing and loud and live you know um matt o'keefe taking it over and what they've done to give us more legitimacy in the platform to provide more of the infrastructure and resources for support from judging to you know event preparation and programming and all that um and then yeah it's in and then um you know loud and live took over the granite games and so that was loud and live saying listen guys you know we do what uh adaptive vision talking to Saudi and i saying we love what you guys are doing, we want to give you the Granite Games as your Wheel Walk Games venue. So yeah, the Granite Games was going to be uh, massive for us because it was going to be, you know, the known brand of Granite Games and the spectators and influence that that draws. And then we were going to highlight our championship there. Our games was mm-hmm. going to be there. Uh, so it would have been monumental for putting new eyes on the, uh, you know, the fittest of the fittest battling for the title. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, that didn't happen. And we wad won't go away with all of this, you know, just like in that same sense that there will be sanctional events and other events outside of the CrossFit structure where yeah. athletes can compete. Uh, that will absolutely exist for the adaptive community. Uh, and it's even more so important that it does because, you know, the inclusion in the open and into the games, you know, who knows? I, again, I don't know the final details on it yet, but I don't imagine that the division, the athletes that qualify per division would exceed 10 at most. And that would be like really optimistic. So there's a ton of other athletes that Mm. won't make it to the games every year and they should compete and they Mm. absolutely should continue to compete against other like adaptive individuals. So having the wheelwad platform to offer scaled and RX versions and continue to offer opportunities to go to a championship and compete internationally is really important. Uh, I think that only helps prepare and funnel more athletes into the CrossFit platform uh, while also still giving the empowerment and opportunity for anybody uh, to get started and to participate uh, with a competition. Yeah, that's cool. Um, Is there an exercise or a stimulus that you can't or haven't yet found an adaptation for that's like roundly used in the sport? Because I mean, doing a clean and jerk with the Aldridge arm and, you know, essentially a one-handed power jerk. Like that's, that's probably as close as you're going to come to doing something that on paper shouldn't be done. Like, is there something that you, that it's, it's roundly, you know, that you might see in the open or the games or somewhere that you think like, God, oh, that's a really hard one to, to find an, an equal match for. Yeah. Great question. Um, a couple of the, you know, the most, General ones, when it comes to my category of upper extremity athletes, when we're talking about muscle ups, it's really hard to match that stimulus. Mm. When we're talking about handstand push ups and handstand walking, yeah. those are really like the three movements in our category, which we have, we have great adaptations for. They're a really great solution. But those are ones where, like, they're not perfect, right? Mm. We didn't really, and you know, honestly, I don't ever regret or wish or think about having two arms. But man, if there's one thing I would like to experience with two arms, it's freaking ring muscle ups. I am so curious what that would feel like. I have a feeling I would just crush ring muscle ups. But uh, yeah, that's probably the one movement that I get a little uh, FOMO out of. 
that in handstand walks. I'm like, because it just looks fun. It just looks like it's a fun thing. And again, mm -hmm. regardless if I had two arms or not, I, I think it would be something I wouldn't be good at, but I would be obsessed with trying to get good at it. And I, I just would, yeah, I'm sure I would. I, I constantly practice one arm handstands, but you could get very little margin of room for error and two arm handstands would be a little more yeah, it's, fun. It's a narrow base. <laughs> Yeah, well, if it's any consolation, I have two arms and I have FOMO about has hand push ups and ring muscle ups, so you're not alone on that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. um, I've finished with a quick fire. Um, yeah. So they're, they're either or. So squat or deadlift? Deadlift. Uh, oh, I'll change this. A cortado or a cold brew? Ooh, cold brew. All day. Uh, bike or row? Bike. Do you use uh your alder arm when you're on the assault bike or do you just go one armed i just go one arm yeah yeah just one arm there yeah i'm trying to think what's worse than me using the assault bike and doing it one-handed is probably yeah it's probably about the only way you could make it worse um hardest movement that you've uh like hardest able-bodied movement that you've found an adaptation for Hmm. Good question. Uh, chest bar pull-ups, skipping pull-ups. Is that like I would say that the difficulty required to do it? I would say, or the difficulty required yeah. to find an alternative. The adaptation that I use uh, for that is like is very technical because mm. it involves finding the appropriate resistance band placing that into my armpit and then still performing the butterfly uh dynamic technique and having my armpit create the same appropriate amount of resistance so that you know i maintain the right cadence uh to me that's like yeah it's extremely technical oh and the mono rope the jump rope Apparently, yeah. double unders, the jump rope is quite difficult. Yeah. Um, God, I can't imagine having like a band digging in. Like, if my wife wants to piss me off, she just jabs me under my armpit and it just sends an electric yeah. shock through my body. So, we, yeah. Oh, dude. Yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah, I definitely second guessed why I was doing this <laughs> when I first started across and I would come home and my armpit would be bleeding. I'd be like, this is diminishing returns here. What's the point? <laughs> Um, but no, I mean, it's, it's all good. A movement um, I can do that I don't like to, I don't like to encourage people to do because I just don't think it's healthy is like one arm bar muscle ups. I can do those. I just think that is the sketchiest. Uh, you have to, your, your arm must be like central kind of, is it? I saw, who did I see doing yeah, them? Oh, what's your name? You still do the big hip. You just Celia, pull over here. Celia Gab, you know, the Italian one, she's, she's coaching with James Newbury now. She's from like Newcastle. Yeah. I saw her doing, she's an able-bodied athlete. I saw her doing one arm and it looks, it's just like, no, nah, there's so much going on that it, like you must crack ribs and, you know, bruise your pelvis and everything. It just looks yeah. horrible. Yeah, I yeah. can do it, but that doesn't mean I should. And that's, yeah. I think, something I, uh, a lesson I taught myself, uh, yeah, about two years ago, like when I did one, I was like, it's awesome. And then once you do one, you know, Every go, hey, I should be one of bum muscle. I'm like, man, this is about to become what I'm known for. And then this is going to be what blows out my rotator cuff. And this is going to be how I don't work out anymore. So um, there's always, you know, the thought of the difference between we're doing fitness to get fitter and more functional. And it's a bit of a soapbox for me, I guess, the adaptive community. And the difference between doing fitness to try to like just show off and it's mm. just kind of a circus trick. Uh, now, trust me. Look at my Instagram. I do that often too, right? Like I, I try to entertain the crowd and show people what a warm guy can do. I mean, look at my freaking mountain biking video. I just put up like about oh, eight shit, but uh, I let the world see it. And um, I become, yeah, I, I'm a, an advocate for doing something that's hard, challenging, painful. It's fine. You can push through and your body will get better over time. But uh, ride be aware of where we get into a place where we have diminishing returns and we're just doing something to show off. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't really have much benefit for us. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask Nano or Metcom, but you're a Nike athlete, aren't you? So there's probably no point asking that. I am. Yeah. Nike athlete. So Nano's obviously. Uh, 
so. <laughs> um listen thanks a million uh for coming on and giving so generous your time i really enjoyed that um i wish you all the best with everything especially all the work that you're doing with crossfit um and the the legitimizing of of your efforts i think best of luck with everything there is in order because it's it's a remarkable movement and if you can pull it off i think it'll be fantastic for it's like that thing of i think eric mentioned himself how the games is that's what gets people in the door of the gyms and i think the more uh people with potential to be adaptive athletes that see adaptive that adaptive athletes in the spotlight i think it'll only encourage inclusion and you know like you say people welcoming people with open arms into gyms um and best of luck with the open as well uh this one and the one in february i'll be looking forward to seeing how you do in both yeah hopefully your, your you. fitness Thank from 2019 you. has prevailed through lockdown and you're you're ready to go i don't know about that man i'm pretty nervous about it and i'm not feeling too fit but i'm gonna give it my best and see what happens but yeah, yeah thank you so much for this opportunity to be on here you know i think uh we talked a lot about you know getting athletes into uh, the competitive environment um, that's something near and dear to my heart as a competitive adaptive athlete but uh, i'd be remiss if i didn't mention to your listeners like what excites me the most about this what makes this the most monumental uh, moment i think when i'm long off this earth is that it's the first step towards um creating more opportunity curiosity and awareness for people with disabilities and also individuals who just have had a negative connotation with CrossFit, with mm -hmm. even take away the brand, with the idea of high intensity functional movements. Um, I think this opportunity, this platform for people with disabilities to compete is gonna do just what CrossFit was doing when it was being so well represented on networks in showing individuals that oh my God, people are doing some insane things with fitness. And oftentimes when we see that from a Mabel body perspective, we can throw out that ridiculous excuse of, wow, look at all these people they are on steroids. No wonder they're so huge. I think when the opportunity comes and you're highlighting people with disabilities, someone in a wheelchair, moving a barbell, moving their chair around and uh, demonstrating wheelchair skills, strength and conditioning to a level that uh, individuals with these disabilities are told constantly by their therapists, medical professionals that you can't, you can't do this. Uh, I think it's gonna have a massive um, kind of tipping effect onto people with disabilities walking or rolling in to CrossFit affiliates mm. around the world. That is what excites me so much because that is why uh, Adaptive Training Academy exists. That's what we do. We educate individuals so that they can be prepared as trainers, coaches, gym owners, or therapists to accept these individuals. So by CrossFit bringing us into the competitive platform, it just reiterates the need and the importance for this education and the access and inclusion in your local boxes. So I have a feeling we're going to get a lot more interest from trainers and coaches and affiliate owners that want to market that they are ATA affiliates so that more adaptive athletes feel accepted and feel like they can go into a safe space and maybe just work out to work out, maybe just work out in order to, you know, live a more healthy, independent life, but also maybe to qualify one day for the CrossFit Games. And how cool of the, are those stories going to be when someone who was disabled, sheltered in their home, didn't leave much, got a part of a community, became healthier and fitter, and started impacting others to pursue that same thing. Like, I think mm. that really holistically changes the world. And I know yeah. I'm biased. And I know, I think even able-bodied or adaptive, I think the, the whole purpose now, I think is just bodies off the couches into the gyms, build a community, get moving, you know, decrease the likelihood of needing medical care and assistance. And I think, you know, if you can stand up out of a chair an able-bodied person can stand up out of a chair when they're 80 or if you can play with your grandkids it's it's worth it to to suffer yeah. through an assault bike workout now is worth it and i think you know there's definitely similar parallels drawn to adaptive community if you're able to you know get up and make your own breakfast or do whatever you need to do because you're training and you're finding it easier then it, you know whatever needs to be done to get that to happen i think is it's good um yeah listen thanks a million uh that was fantastic um if you ever think of anyone else that you think i should have on 
let me know like point me in their direction i'd rather have them on i think uh i don't have a huge audience but i i would like to highlight you know ata and wheelwad and the work that's being done and the efforts that are being made because i think it is cool like and i think it's there's a there's a lot more noise being made by people who are doing fuck all really <laughs> so i think it's important that right. people who are doing good stuff are highlighted as well so um, well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah, and there's endless, endless individuals, remarkable stories, and people would love to share. Um, mm. sh- direct them towards you for sure. Yeah, um, cool. And um, yeah, for your listeners, I always like to say this too. If you want to put it, I don't know if this will go into the podcast or if you want yeah. to put it in the show notes, but would love to give them, if there are any trainers, coaches, gym owners that are interested in Adaptive Training Academy's course, always like to give a 10% discount for the podcast listeners. Absolutely, yeah. So if that. you have like a preferred code, it's just coffee pods is what people tend to use. Coffee pods ten is what yep. I'll use. All Perfect. Caps. Perfect. So I'll, I'll, I'll set that up. Whether they take our self paced or whether they take one of our guided cohorts, if they use coffee pods ten all caps, mm-hmm. uh, they'll get ten percent off. Uh, it's just our way to show some appreciation. Cool. Appreciate that. Thanks very much. That's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. And they can learn more at it's our website's easy, ata.fit. Lovely. Perfect. Um, well, listen, thanks, Emil. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. I'm going to... Thanks, Peter. Actually, in 30 minutes, I've got a podcast with Talking Elite Fitness. So I oh. uh, appreciate it. Yeah. They've been on with me, so t- 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 tell, them, tell them I said hi. I sure will. I'm going to be on with Tommy. So I'll tell Tommy you said what's up. Cool. Cheers. Thanks, Emil. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Peter. See you. Thank <laughs> you.